Hello, 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 everyone. Heidi Reese here, and I am the Trainings Program Manager for Dayton Superior. So who's ready for some Training Tuesday? You should all be yelling right now, but I can't hear you because you're all muted. So that's a reminder that I don't want you to not ask questions and have, uh, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to do that through the Zoom functionality. Uh, there's a chat feature and a question and answer feature. Feel free to use that throughout and I'll be monitoring that. And we'll definitely take care of you at the very end with a mini question and answer session. In addition, I want to remind you guys that each webinar is recorded and we put those out on Dayton Superior's YouTube channel, as well as DaytonSuperior.com and organized by the product type. So this will go on the rebar splicing page, among others. So real quick, like always, this presentation is intended for training purposes only. So what that means is any products that we will talk about within this presentation, um, please refer to DaytonSuperior.com for technical data sheets, safety data sheets, application guides, you name it for the products that we're going to be discussing. Dayton Superior, we're the leading provider of engineered solutions for the concrete construction industry. So we're not just about the rebar splicing that we're going to be talking about today, but we handle accessories, chemicals, and forming, proven solutions for forming uh, and shoring. We handle chemicals, like I said, for concrete repair and restoration. Rich deck, rebar splicing, like we're going to talk about, precast and tilt-up construction. We have a whole gambit of things. In addition, we have an engineering team, one of the largest in the industry, and something near and dear to my heart and Chuck, who is hanging out right beside me here's heart, is the training. So within this presentation, it's very uh, small. They have to be for Training Tuesday, short and sweet and to the point. But if there's anything else that you want to know about, feel free to email us at training at DaytonSuperior.com and there'll be a QR code at the very end that you can scan and you can get your request in for a customized training and we can get you taken care of. So I let the cat out of the back. Who's going to be talking about splicing specification adjustments today? None other than Mr. Chuck Hope and he's our national training manager here at Dayton Superior and he has been in the construction industry for 49 years, almost 50, that's pretty exciting. First 20 of those years, he was in sales, uh, was a dealer for accessories and forming, and let's not forget the chemical products. Uh, he has a business and civil engineering degree and is Dayton Superior's subject matter expert. Now, for all of you who've been coming to training Tuesdays, I say that all the time, but I really mean it. He is the subject matter expert and he knows a lot of stuff even beyond the concrete construction industry. So hit him up on a question on that, but uh, here's Chuck guys. <laughs> well, thank you, Heidi. As Heidi alluded, we are going to be talking about the uh, splicing uh, specification adjustments that have happened, not really yesterday or the day before. This actually happened in 2020. Uh, 2020 ACI actually revamped their specification. Uh, a, a, excuse me, ACI uh, re-adapted everything to handle their on their 318 specification, 318 19. At 318 19, they actually adapt, adopted to go to a new specification for rebar. So when and the rebar realistically didn't change all that much. It just basically they uh, converted A615 to match up the A706 type rebar. So basically across the nation, we are now working under the same specification. So for the basis of selection, you know, we've got basically for mechanical connections, you got uh, a lap splice, taking two pieces of rebar lapping them over each other, put tying them with tie wire. Uh, you have a welded splice, which was probably the oldest connect of connection that they have here. Uh, it's also probably the one that is actually least used in the industry, just because of the cost of welding. Uh, and then there's a the mechanical connector. Uh, it can, those can be either a threaded connection 
with a parallel or a taper thread, a shear bolt, lock shear bolt system, uh, similar to a uh, bar lock uh, coupler system. You can also do a swedged system here, which can either be done at the fabrication shop or on site. And obviously, uh, we're getting into the grout filled connectivities also. So, with that being said, you know, the last slice, the great slice for years, guys have used this just slapping bars over, uh, usually 30 to 40 to 50 bar diameters, depending on specification. And they would actually uh, last slice it and then tie it up with tie wire and then pour the concrete around it. Typically, that wasn't uh, available for a 14 or 18 bar. Uh, and in vertical applications, it got very congested. It became very difficult, especially with the amount of rebar that were typically going up in caissons. So uh, with lapping the two reinforcement bars, placing them side by side, it is concrete dependent. So the reliability of that lap is found to be sufficient in calculations for cyclic loading, et cetera. But if the concrete is damaged in and around that splice, uh, it typically becomes, uh, you know, non-function. It basically has lost its capability of transferring the load from one bar to the other. So as you can see here, a lot of job bars here, you can see how they've been corroded up. You see where they've actually highlighted the bar. Uh, there should typically be another bar right around alongside that coming in and up to it. Uh, but you see that a lot of times when you have cold joints or actually just a construction joint in the slab, moisture gets in, hits the bar, and what's the first thing that starts the rest? The steel. So what will happen is the rebar will actually then start to degradate from rust, et cetera. So with that being said, once the, the rebar uh, starts to go, a lot of times if it'll generate a little bit of rust and what will happen is it will eventually pop the concrete or basically spall the concrete. Uh, basically worsening the situation as far as uh, the embedment of the steel within the concrete. <coughs> Another situation that we are currently having on a lot of structures across the U.S. Uh, is congestion. I mean, realistically, when you look at the amount of rebar that is inside some of these concrete structures, it gets a little crazy. Uh, you're starting to see a lot more bigger bar, a lot more 11, 14, 18 rebar uh, being used. I know back uh, when I first started uh, in the uh, splicing end of the industry back in the uh, 90s, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of 18 splices. Now it seems to be an everyday occurrence. And what you're looking at here is a standard rebar cage, typically in a column network coming up. And what happens here is how do you get concrete with the aggregate and right into all those little nooks and crannies and everything in there? A lot of times what happens is you end up with rock pockets, but no liquid material in there to help fill any of those minute voids, et cetera. And when you have a, an area that's, you know, non-consolidated in and around, it's an area for water to gather. And what happens if you're in the northern half of the country, that's going to actually freeze and then pop and scrap your concrete, et cetera. So, you got to be very careful with that. Uh, so vibration is extremely important on here. But if you have so much steel in it, there's nothing you can really do. 
ACI typically requires an 8% steel to concrete ratio. So that means for surface area of the, of the concrete, you have to have 8% of that surface area has to be has to be steel going across. And you can see how slicing in some of these situations can be, as you can see, how do you get material, how do you get concrete, how do you get aggregate in, in place here? Uh, so a lot of these uh, situations here, because a lot of this is all lap slice, et cetera. So what you're starting to see now is more and more uh, great, different grades of rebar, typically used to be grade 60, was probably the most common in the marketplace up until about probably 15 years ago. About 15 years ago, we started going grade 75, then 80. Now we're starting to see grade 100 rebar. So, you know, usually cyclic requirements, million cycles, typically is con pretty consistent. Uh, Done on projects here, we've had as many as 5 million cycles for the bar. So loading splice and tension, uh, typically you've got zero, basically zero to 12,000 PSI. So slip, uh, slip between is the movement between the rebars within the rebar splice. Typically, when we're talking slip, we're talking usually we're measuring it on the top and the bottom of the coupler. And basically, it's how much that coupler stretches, so to speak, before it actually starts to fail. Uh, a lot of times, rebar will actually stretch prior, prior to, but a lot of times, if it's a solid rebar, a lot of times what it will do is it will, depending on how much pressure is put on it, it will spring back into shape. So what did CRSI and what did the ACI do with their specification? Well, ASTM, which is the American Standards Testing Material, A615 rebar specification. In 19, or excuse me, in 2020, the revision was launched to take A615 special specification, A615-20, the tensile strength requirements for A615 rebar, grade 60 and 80 have been reduced to 80 KS, 80 P PSI and 100 PSI respectively. These are the same requirements that A706 rebar, so that the changes of A706 material now meets or exceeds all chemical and mechanical requirements for the respective size of the grade of A615. So basically what they've done is they've taken A706 and brought it up or brought A615 down to that level to actually, uh, so that both bars are now on the same grade level. A706 is still a little bit more ductile material. It is bendable and it is weldable. A615 is well is bendable, but typically they don't like the weld. The welding process with A615 is a little more complicated than A706. So with that being said, the bars that were marked with a W and certified to meet 706, W means weldable, and bars marked with an S, meaning A615, uh, will be marked with a W and S are considered dual grades since they both, both meet A706 and A615. Since the F706 rebar inherently meets the requirements of A615, all W bar will also be accepted as dual grade. So what the specification is basically telling us here is that A706 and A16 revisions written, these are for specifications written after and 
above and beyond uh, ACI 615-20. So any future specifications for that, they actually meet this criteria. If it's prior to that, they have to go by the old specifications where you have a diff different grade strengths for different materials. So basically, uh, you can permit bar with a W marking to be certified for both 706 and A615. Uh, but this change has not yet been adopted by the, as a publishing of this bulletin. So uh, it is coming here shortly. You will see it all the way through. The industry is actually, because we're realistically, we're seeing a lot of projects still written under A615 uh, dash either 16 or 17 uh, being used, or actually, I think it's 14 and still being used. So some producers can continue to practice putting both the letter markings on their bar, but this will no longer be a requirement. If there are questions regarding this product, the best source of information will be the providing mill, which where the rebar is actually uh, poured. So when we're talking about anything prior to a 31819, uh, which is basically the 31819 is actually the new where the newer codes actually were adopted, even though it was in 2020. Uh, it's actually the code was actually written in 31819. Uh, what's happened is you see how here we have the specification. A so this is this is for those. Specificate jobs specified prior to. You've got on an ACE, on a grade 60, you have a 90 KSI specified tinsel strength of the bar. And on grade 80, you have 105. Well, that relates all to a mechanical and, and your splicing requirements for type one and type two. What has happened with this new specification when you drop in the new numbers of 80, it changes to a type two splice, only 80 KSI. Okay, and then with grade 100, it goes from 105 to 100,000. So what this actually does now is lower the requirements for the mechanical coupler that has to meet an ultimate tinsel strengths. So where a lot of couplers typically fell short, had to be classified as a type one, can now be classified as a type two requirement because of the lower strength requirements. Major difference between this, the two standards is A706 rebar. Um, we're seeing more and more projects being uh, being constructed with 706 rebar. Typically, that was always a, in the US here, it was always a West Coast application bar, primarily designed because of seismic. But as we're seeing more and more applications moving eastward with the bar, because the bar is much more friendly to you, friendlier to use because it is bendable and weldable. Uh, what's the difference between 706 and 615? Well, chemicals in the 7, 706 rebar are more tightly controlled to enhance the weldability and ductility. There are maximum limits, limits put on the carbon manganese, sulfur, silicon, and phosphorus content within 706 rebar. So, and those limits are typically monitored extremely uh, closely. Uh, A615 typically has a, a high, a basically a limit on phosphorus content. Uh, you can see A615 is typically uh, a little bit uh, more, I'm gonna say it's a little bit more of a, uh, a rebar that can be produced with a, Different wide, 
chemical composition, but we give you the same results. Uh, but the reason, you know, the 706 is so much more preferred in the marketplace is because it can be welded at lower temperatures than A615. Six, A615, a lot of times will require you to preheat the bar. So all welding and welding procedures should consult AWS uh, D1.4, the welding code. Uh, anytime you have any, any projects where require any welding, uh, it is always best that you consult AWS on that. So what does that mean for mechanical couplers? Well, uh, typically mechanical couplers have always been precise, reliable connections, lower installed costs than a lot of Lap, lap splices that are required within the project. Typically, they're more reliable uh, than a lap splice. Uh, they're not concrete dependent. They have been tested. Typically, you're going to get either a type one or a type two, depending on what coupler you pick. And most of these couplers typically will come back out and show you the great strength that they, you know, re report time in, time out again. So, the mechanical coupler is typically a type one. Type one has to be 125% of the display shield of the rebar. A type two has to be 100% of the specified tensile strength of the rebar. Uh, and when you look at it, the specified yield strength of their rebar, grade 60 rebar, is still 60,000 KSI. So 125 of that is going to be 75,000. But if you had a type 1 coupler that met the 75,000 or 78,000, or let's say it even met 81 or 82 percent, of the specified tensile strength of the rebar, and you're under the old specification, the bar would, the coupler would still be a type one. Under the new specification, it would actually meet the type two designation. So you have to be very careful. What's happened, what we're seeing here is a lot of the couplers that were type one can now also be tested and confirmed as a type two coupler. The one both one product that Dayton Superior offers that really makes a difference because almost all of our products are basically based off of type one, type two, and most of ours meet the type two, except for the box shear bolt system. We actually have a specific type one coupler and a type two coupler. Our SCA type coupler typically met a uh, type one requirements under the old specification. Under the new specification, that SCA coupler will now meet a type two splice, primarily just because it was, it was a great coupler as a type one, almost, almost made it to a type two but just fell short. But now with the lower strength requirements, it does fall into that type two category. Now for threading couplers, just FYI, all of our threaded couplers actually already meet a type two connection. So therefore this specification really makes no difference to that. That specification is actually put in place here. Uh, so anything that was a type two coupler prior to is still going to be a type two. The only ones that are going to change is they have to actually any of the ones that were a type one, like our bar lock coupler, for example, or FCA bar lock coupler. The SCA comes in and was, was a great repair splice designed specifically for uh, rehab work, et cetera, concrete repair work. So basically you cut out the old concrete area, you cut out the old rebar, 
uh, cut a piece of rebar to fit the splice area and throw the coupler on both sides of it. Put the bar up next to the where the new bar will go. And slide the couplers outward, make the connections, and you're ready to pour concrete. But what we've seen also here in the last oh, 20 years, 25 years, has been a lot of uh, bar lock couplers are now being used for uh, initial construction process. Uh, prim prim primarily in the caisson market because of the congestion within that uh, and because of the strength and, and basically for help alleviating a bunch of congestion within the bar so you don't have all that lap length of bar. And you'll see we've got that we can do uh, bar lock couplers in a variety of different coatings. Here's a galvanized, a black, obviously. We can also do an epoxy coated coupler cage here and we're seeing cages that we're actually doing where like we're doing 140 foot long cages 270 foot cages joined together thick and then dropped into the caisson uh, from one end uh, these cages typically get put into place here quick and easy and you know with one drop you're putting it all in place and you see what that coupler has done, how it has freed up so that concrete can flow in between the rebar uh, without any congestion problems here. And the bar lock coupler here obviously comes in different variations. The SCA is the big one that is a, typically a type one. It is can be used now for a type two also. We also have our L series, which also meets the type two already, uh, and a type one for grade 75. Uh, we have our XL series, which is basically type two for grade 80. Uh, a few more bolts on each end, makes it work a little better. And we got transitions, weldables, and end anchors to accommodate all of these other products here. So where do you want to find all your information well you got daytonsuperior.com it's your quick one-stop shop for everything you got product product and system web pages you've got handbooks you can get on there or you can actually view them right on that site you've got technical data sheets that can be printed out or viewed uh right direct from your from the website your application guides, how to put the product in, how the, how the product is actually used and applied. You can also search functionality and more. You can also search via all your DOT requirements from that same website and our BABA requirements for that product line. And we've got here with just a quick little uh, cheat sheet, so to speak, is the slicing selection guy. Uh, now we are going to, this is actually coming through here with different splices, and you see that we haven't really, we've got to come back through and change a couple of this, these items on here now because of the SCA coupler, but we can't jump the gun on this because there are still a lot of projects that are written with specifications prior to 318.19 being implement so with that being said we're still we're still keeping these as depending on what the spe job site specifications are that's where your key actually starts to whether this how the, this is going to affect you we've also got on our website here a regional contact if you're wondering who your key regional tsr is your technical sales representative for splicing. Uh, you've got, uh, we have uh, three of them across the country that you can call and talk to. Uh, they're available here. You can get their names and their phone numbers here on this site here uh, to hook you up and get you connected with everybody in that uh, uh, product line category. So now, if you do need additional training, 
please. Here's the barcode to scan. Uh, if you don't have if you don't have your phone available with you right now, just remember you can go to DaytonSuperior.com, uh, request a training class right on that site, or if you're interested in this training class, go to DaytonSuperior.com, select search Training Tuesday, and this will be posted here a little bit later today. Usually, usually no later than tomorrow morning, but usually today. Uh, this will go out, uh, be posted, and if you've got any questions, yeah. please. Now's the time to, to put them in. Put them in. So we'll hold off a few minutes here and see what we've got. Great timing on the, on the time there, Mr. Chuck. Yeah. So yeah, if you guys have questions, go ahead and put it either through chat in Zoom or the Q&A section. We'll give it just a, another second. Um, next week, what are we doing next week? We're going to be doing chemicals. chemicals. Yeah. Chemicals. Chemical Epoxy. injection. Injection. Yep. So sign up for that one. Um, yep. Chuck said that the, the thing would come out later and you can sign up with that email. And it looks like we don't have any questions. So that is it for today, everyone. I want you all to have a fantastic Tuesday and I'll see you next week. Have a good day, everybody. Bye now.